Hello, I'm your host, Anna Danino, and welcome to the first installment of the Crime Bistro podcast. This show gazes into the thrillingly twisted world of true crime, examining real cases while we share in a passion for crime and coffee alike. For this episode, I am enjoying a cold brew with almond milk, so grab yourself a fresh brew and let's get into the story of the disappearance of Maura Murray. This is one of the cases that has fascinated me the most since I've become more interested in true crime. And it's also one of the stories that baffles and frustrates me the most because there are just so few answers in this case. And I do want to note that I've done my best to compile the most accurate and up-to-date research in this case, but due to how famous it is and the amount of people who have tried to look into it online, there is a lot of conflicting information that can be found across different internet sources. Mora was born on May 4th of 1982 in Brockton, Massachusetts, and she grew up in Hanson, Massachusetts, which is a suburb on the South Shore. Her parents are Fred Murray, a medical technician, and Lori, who's a nurse, and they got divorced when she was really young, when she was about six years old. Mora lived with her mother, but she remained very close with her father throughout her life. She also grew up with her older brother Fred Jr., her sisters Kathleen and Julie, and her younger brother Curtis. According to moramurraymissing.org, she was active in her local community, and she was really well known for her kindness and especially for her beautiful smile. She was an overachiever, and she was very successful both academically and athletically. She was a runner. She disappeared on February 9th of 2004. She was in a car accident that night, and when police arrived, the car was locked and no one was there. So note that because she went missing in 2004, this is almost before the time of cell phones, so there's a very limited digital trail for police to follow, but this was the last that anyone has ever heard from her. Mora was 5'7", 120 pounds, and she was a dedicated runner, but she wasn't currently on a team, although she did run track in high school. Her sister Julie went to West Point, and Mora followed her there. She accepted a congressional nomination from the late Senator Edward Kennedy, and she studied chemical engineering while she was at West Point, which is incredibly difficult. Mora was caught stealing makeup from West Point, and she withdrew from the school on January 2, 2002, after pleading guilty of the theft in front of the Cadet Advisory Board. And if you don't know that much about the military academies like West Point, they're extremely strict, and even small offenses like that can essentially be the end of your academic career. After this, Mora decided to go to UMass Amherst, So she enrolled there as a nursing student, and she was a junior there when she went missing. She got into a little bit of trouble at UMass uh, as well. She was charged with credit card fraud while she was there in November of 2003. So there was a female student at UMass who had noticed some odd charges on her account. Someone had been using her credit card number to order food from a local pizza place called Pinocchio's Pizza. This student called the police, and the pizza place checked their delivery records, and they found out that the orders had been delivered to Mora's dorm room. So the police set up a bit of a sting investigation, and that night when Mora called Pinocchio's, the police followed the delivery man to Mora's room, and when she signed the bill, signed the receipt for the delivery, the police approached her, and she did admit to taking the credit card number, The way that she found it, she said, was off of a receipt that she'd found in a trash can. And the charges only amounted to $79.02. So police documents suggested that Mora was placed on probation. And the charges would have been dismissed in February 2004, which is when she went missing, provided that she stayed out of further trouble. The receipts did show that she was buying large quantities of food at once. So like multiple pizzas, multiple sandwiches. And there have been speculations that Mora was bulimic because she did live alone in her dorm room at the time, so there's no no one knows if she was ordering to share with someone else. There likely wasn't anybody there. But I don't really want to speak to that because nothing has ever been confirmed. That's just kind of a rumor. So now we're going to get into the events in the days that lead up to Mora's disappearance, starting with February 5th. This was a Thursday. She had a late night shift at her job. 
She worked campus security, so I'm assuming that she was um, in the dorm rooms, one of the people who swiped to get people into their buildings, because she worked um, at a front desk. So she had a call with her sister Kathleen that night, and there's not much information about this besides what Kathleen has said about it, but that Kathleen was having some issues with her fiancé and that Maura was listening to her and helping her talk through it. At about 1 o'clock in the morning, a supervisor came across Mora, and she was alone at the desk. She seemed really upset, and all she would say was bothering her was her sister. The supervisor was really worried about Mora and walked her back to her room. And the supervisor actually mentioned being nervous about leaving her alone in that state, but Mora told the supervisor that their, her roommate was home, even though, like I mentioned, she lived alone in her dorm room at the time. Nothing of note happened on February 6th, but on February 7th, Maura's father Fred came to visit her to go used car shopping. Apparently her car was kind of a clunker, and it was about to basically just stop working. She had a good relationship with her father, he had even been her basketball coach when she was younger. And his timeline of this day does have some oddities in it. Um, He's changed a couple of the details a few times, so that has led people to be a little bit suspicious of him, but I don't honestly think it's anything super notable. They spent the afternoon looking for cars in Northampton, and then he took Mora and a friend to dinner. After dinner, he took them to a liquor store to buy alcohol for a party that they were planning to attend, and this was going to be on campus. And it's here where he said a couple of conflicting things. At first, that he said he was in the car while they were in the store. And in a later interview, he said that he was in the store and that he had told them to hurry up while they were making their selections. He loaned Mora his brand new car for the night, and she dropped him off at a motel. And this is notable because it's a little bit weird considering that he knew she was going to be drinking that night and had taken her to buy the alcohol and then would lend her a brand new car. Um, not really sure what to think about that, but it is kind of weird. She left the party at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and around 3.30 she was driving through Hadley, Massachusetts, on her way to bring the car back to the motel, and she actually hit a guardrail, doing about $10,000 worth of damage to the brand new car. So again, considering what ended up happening, it is kind of weird that her father would have lended her the car in the first place. But Mora responded to this by calling a tow truck, and it's thought that the driver just brought her back to the motel. And no sobriety test was performed by Mora that night, even though she had likely been drinking, and apparently she was visibly shaken. Of course, he would be after a car accident. But considering that she crashed straight into a guardrail... Um, you would think that any police officer would do a sobriety test. I'm not really sure why one wasn't done at this point. But Fred has said that she came into the motel room and he didn't know that she was there until he woke up in the morning. And this is another one of those things that doesn't really make a lot of sense. No one knows if there were one or two beds in the room. And no one actually knows how she would have gotten into the room because she didn't have a key. So... If someone from the front desk had let her in, I'm not really sure why they would do that. That's not common practice. But either way, somehow she made her way into the room. And at 4.49 a.m., she made a call from Fred's phone to her boyfriend, whose name was Billy, uh, most likely to tell him about the accident. And he himself has, since Maura went missing, talked about this call. So we know that it was Maura calling from Fred's phone and not Fred just calling uh, Billy. They did seem to have a good relationship. It was a long-distance relationship, and there have been some rumors that they were both cheating on one another. However, Billy hasn't ever talked about this, and nothing has ever been confirmed. When Fred was asked about this night, he said that he wasn't really upset about the car. He mentioned he was actually more concerned about how he was going to get to work the next day, and he said that insurance was going to cover the damages, so he got a rental car and then just dropped more off at campus and left. He called her um, on February 8th at 11.30, and this was at night, and they agreed to fill out the insurance forms and to have a conversation about the car again the following Monday night. 
and Mora said that she was going to pick up the forms herself and try and get them filled out. Okay, so now we're going to look into and unpack the events of February 9th, which is when Mora went missing. So on this day, Mora went on her computer and looked at MapQuest. She looked up directions to Berkshire and Burlington, Vermont. At 1 p.m., she sent an email to her boyfriend and told him she had received some messages from him, but that she hadn't really felt like talking to anyone and that they would talk later. And then she signed off saying, love you, Mora. At 1.24 p.m., she emailed her supervisor at nursing school, saying that she was going to be out of town for a week, and she said that this was going to be due to a death in the family, um, and this was not true. They've talked to family members about this, and they all said that they had no idea what she was talking about. But after the email, she made a call to the owner of a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire, which is a town where she had spent some time in the past. And since her disappearance, Fred Murray has said that Mora uh, really loved the White Mountains area and she was pretty familiar with it. She also called the number 1-800-GO-STO, which is a line for booking hotel reservations, but she didn't make a reservation and the call was very brief, so it's unclear if she actually spoke with anyone or if that call actually connected. But nobody knows where she was planning on heading. She packed up toiletries, textbooks, makeup, and several days worth of clothes. She also packed up some athletic clothing. And then she packed her stuff in her dorm room into boxes, and she had actually taken down all of her photos off of the walls, which seems like something that would be just kind of odd behavior for someone who was planning on coming back. She left campus, and then she stopped about 10 minutes later at an ATM. This was 3.15 p.m., and she withdrew almost all of the money from her bank account. This was about $280. There is video security from the ATM that showed she was alone when she made this transaction. She then went to a liquor store and she spent $40 on alcohol. She bought Kahlua, vodka, Baileys, and a box of Franzia wine. It almost looked like she was running away at this point. However, she did pick up the insurance forms for her father's car. And Fred has spoken about this multiple times, and he said why would she have picked up the insurance forms if she wasn't ever planning on coming back, which makes sense. The last recorded use of her cell phone was at 4.37pm. She called to check her own voicemail. This was something that um, was a function of old phones, where you have to call your voicemail in order to hear your messages. And no one knows if she had a voicemail to listen to, or if there was one that maybe she deleted. But authorities report that she left the area at around 4.30pm, and she started driving north towards New Hampshire. While Mora was driving on Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire, she was in an accident in her 1996 Black Saturn sedan. A neighbor whose name was Faith Westman called the police at 7.27pm and she said there had been an accident near her home and that there was a car stuck in a ditch. When the police found Mora's car, it was facing west in the eastbound lane, almost like the car had spun out. And this did happen on a sharp curve, and she crashed into a stand of trees. The temperature on that day, the low temperature, was about 7 degrees, so the road was likely really snowy and really icy, which would have been super treacherous in her car that was already not working very well. And she was in the middle of the White Mountains, in the dark, the roads were very twisty anyway, it would have been really easy to just lose control. The first person to come across her after the accident was a, nam a man named Butch Atwood. He was a bus driver, and he had just driven, I believe, it was a team, and he was returning home for the night. He asked her how she was, and she said that she was shaken up. And he said that she was shaken up and the airbags had deployed, but she didn't have any blood on her face, and he said that he was going to go and call the police. Mora asked him not to call the police because she had already called AAA and said that they were on their way to, to help her, um, but this wasn't true, and Butch also said that he knows this wasn't true because there wasn't even cell phone service up there for her to be able to call for help. So because he knew this, he went home and called the police, and it was at about 7.46pm that the responding officer arrived. 
Butch says that it only took him seven to nine minutes that he was gone, and it was during that time that Mora completely vanished. The car was locked, there was no one in it, the bottle of Kahlua was gone, and there was absolutely no trace of Mora anywhere. The contents of the car, when the police officer arrived, included the alcohol that she had, uh, MapQuest directions to Burlington, Vermont, and also to Stowe, Vermont, a stuffed animal, the insurance forms that she had picked up, and a book called Not Without Peril, which is about hiking in the White Mountains. Her cell phone and debit and credit cards were uh, not found in the car. However, there hasn't been any recorded use of her bank accounts or her cell phone since she disappeared. And a neighbor who saw the whole thing from her kitchen window said that she saw a second person in Mora's car smoking a cigarette, but she did later say that she was probably just unsure of what she had seen, and she said it could have been a reflection from a cell phone, maybe. But this is notable because the family of Mora's boyfriend has since said that several people um, who lived in the area had approached them to say that they did see a man in the car with her, but nothing to this nature has ever been confirmed, and I believe it's highly unlikely. Butch said that Mora was alone, and Butch has actually since been cleared of any suspicion in this case. From the accident, the car's radiator had been pushed into the fan, and this was just caused by the impact of her crashing, and this would have essentially totaled the car, it wouldn't have been drivable, and she wouldn't have been able to leave the scene in that vehicle. The police found a Diet Coke bottle in the car that they said smelled of alcohol and it was believed to have been filled with wine because red liquid was found splashed on the ceiling of the car and on the driver's side door. The bottle did appear to have a red liquid in it as well. So she's widely believed to have been drinking and driving, which could have been the reason that she didn't want the police to be called in the scenario. Remember from the credit card fraud, she was already on probation. So it is possible that she could have panicked and ran into the woods to hide. It isn't uncommon for people who are drunk driving to leave the scene and then return a few days later um, once they've sobered up with an explanation for why they abandoned the car and another explanation for what could have caused the accident. So that was kind of what police were initially thinking and at the start this wasn't expected to become a missing persons case. The windshield of the car was also cracked as if something had hit it and her car was towed and impounded, and it's actually still at the impound. Like, to this day, people go and they take pictures with it, which is a little bit weird. And once they found the car, the immediate search was done by the responding officer based on suggestions from Butch Atwood, who suggested that he look west of the accident scene and start to search roads in the French Pond area, which he did. A state trooper also responded to the scene and also searched the roads to the west of the accident. Eight firemen were called to the scene, and emergency medical services also responded. The firemen did a short, a short search without finding anything, and the emergency medical services, they were um, told to leave pretty much right after they arrived, just because Moore wasn't even there to be treated. However, the most thorough search wasn't conducted until February 11th, and a total of five searches were conducted by the New Hampshire State Police in 2004. These searches included helicopters and dogs, but nothing of real note was ever found. In the first search, there was a total of three canine teams and an air search that was conducted by New Hampshire Fish and Game. Sounds drive. There was a pair of gloves in Mora's back seat that she had just been given for Christmas and they were brand new, so this is what the dog was given in order to follow Mora's Sounds scent. Drive. And Fred has criticized this a lot since it happened. He said that it probably would have been a lot more accurate if they had used an item that she used all the time. But the dog lost her scent really quickly. About a hundred yards east was where they were able to trace it to, and no sign of her was ever found in the woods. There weren't any discernible tracks that could be connected with Mora either. So she was basically just completely gone. Sounds drive. A BOLO, which stands for Be on the Lookout, was issued for Mora on February 10th at around 12.30 p.m., and this was to Grafton County, Littleton, Haverhill, and Lisbon. And when police contacted Fred on February 10th to tell him what had happened and that Mora's car had been found, 
He did mention that if they found a rag in the tailpipe of the car, it was because he told her to put it there because the car wasn't running very well. Um, he said that he told Mora to do this to avoid being ticketed for the excessive smoke that was coming out of her tailpipe. And the tailpipe, the muffler, and the exhaust system were actually removed from her car when it was impounded. So there's no way to tell what was really causing that or if this had worked for Mora. But it is a little bit weird, I think, just for Fred to make the suggestion in the first place. And when the police actually called, Fred had been at work. So he didn't find out through the police, he found out through a call from Mora's older sister. Her family and the rest of the family, um, not just Fred, and her boyfriend also were informed Sounds on February 10th. And her boyfriend's family had actually been paying for Mora's trip away and her cell phone. Uh, apparently they thought that the relationship was really serious, they thought the two of them were going to get married, and right. they would visit with Mora all the time, they were very involved in her life, they loved her. And they were also really involved in the search efforts for Mora, especially in the first couple months after she disappeared. Fred Murray arrived on February 11th in the early morning, around 8 o'clock in the morning, which is when the wide-scale search began, and Billy and his family drove up to the area on the same day, and they arrived around 5 o'clock p.m. Billy stayed in the area until February 22nd to help search for Mora, and his parents stayed until the 23rd. So on the night of February 11th, Billy got a phone call from a random number, and he really thought it was Mora at the time. He said he heard someone breathing really softly until they had hung up the phone. And this is a very big point in this case, a lot of people bring this up, however it has been confirmed that the call was actually from a first responder from the American Red Co Cross who had called Billy, but they hadn't had enough service to complete the call just because of where they were. By February 14th, 2004, the Haverhill, New Hampshire police had announced that they ended their ground search, but that they were continuing with the investigation and they were still considering it a priority case. A second search was done about 10 days after her disappearance. This was on February 19th, as the FBI joined the investigation into Moore's disappearance, including ground and air searches, tracking dogs, and cadaver dogs as well. Further searches were conducted on May 8th, May 17th and July 13th, and all of these found nothing notable, no trace of Mora anywhere. The New Hampshire League of Investigators, which was a team of retired police officers and detectives, picked up this case pro bono in 2006, and they also conducted three large searches, but they also didn't find anything. And the search for Mora even extended into Vermont, since the printout directions to Burlington had been found in her car. But uh, that's basically it in this case. There hasn't really been a theory that has prevailed as the most likely options. There's no evidence that she escaped into the woods. There's no evidence that she was picked up. There's no evidence of foul play. There have been some unconfirmed sightings, but nothing that has been shown to be concrete. But there are definitely a lot of theories, and there are constantly new theories being put forward. There's a theory that she picked up and started a new life, that maybe she moved to Canada. There is the possibility that she's picked up by someone, or just that she was lost in the woods. Uh, Billy has mentioned that he's convinced her leaving UMass was related to some sort of negative incident with another student, and he really believes that someone from the school knows why she left. And her family is convinced that there's some sort of foul play involved with Mora's case. They're convinced that someone picked her up, that someone, uh, you know, possibly kidnapped her. But her case remains open to this day, and to this day, nothing has really been found. However, there is actually a recent news coverage update for this case, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, Moore's family remained hopeful, and they have throughout the years. And a possible lead has emerged, and this is from a Boston 25 news article published um, on September 14th of 2021, so not very long ago. Um, the New Hampshire authorities reported that a construction crew found human bone fragments on Loon Mountain. And Maura's sister Julie has spoken about this, and she was interviewed for this article. She said that she had a different feeling about 
um, this finding than others in the past. So they are going to be testing the bone fragments to see if they are related to Mora's case at all. And Julie said um, the following about the case in general. She said, this is how it's going to happen. These are how these cold cases get solved. Somebody stumbles upon something. There are answers out there somewhere. Maybe this is the answer for my family and for Mora. And I really do think she's right. I think there are answers in this case somewhere. There have to be. People don't just disappear without a trace. Um, so hopefully that this turns into something and the family can kind of get the closure that they want and that they're looking for. For so many years, this case has baffled law enforcement and true crime enthusiasts, and the best that we can hope for after all of these years is some closure and just answers for Amora's family. She was a beautiful young woman, and regardless of what happened to her on that night, I hope that she will forever be remembered for her kindness and for that infectious smile. If you would like to support Mora and her family, please visit the show notes for this podcast at crimebistro.com, where I will have linked to the family's Blue Ribbon campaign. On October 16th, 2020, a request was made to erect a historical marker that would recognize Mora at the location on the highway where she was last seen. And the tree that was home to Moore's Blue Ribbon was heartbreakingly torn down in early 2021. So the family is asking for a show of support on Moore's website via their Blue Ribbon campaign, and I really urge you to go and check that out. Uh, being an active true crime listener, I think, is very important, and I think the family would really appreciate it and would really love any help that they can get. And with that, this episode is coming to a close. So I thank you for taking the time to hear Mora's story, and I invite you to join me next week for another true crime mystery. Until next time.